I'm Lauren from RDU on stage. I'm here with my colleague, um, Galandra Smith, who I know from the American Theater Critics Association, who is an Atlanta based, Atlanta area based journalist, arts journalist, um, freelance writer, queen of all things, because you wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna say <laughs> and I'm so happy to um chat with you tonight see old friends the best part about these videos is I get to connect with people so it's nice to see you um it's nice to see you too thank you so much for having me on well thank you um I, I so I was reading your bio and it says you knew you wanted to be a writer in the second grade so you were young like I was when did you when do you first remember having that moment that you wanted to be a writer that that even became a career option for you so i would say that in second grade I, my second grade teacher used to give us these things called story starters or prompts and it was my favorite part about school because i was always a chatty kathy and so it was kind of the first thing I was affirmed for in school as being good at it, as opposed to getting in trouble for talking too much in class. And so I really enjoyed being able to explore my imagination through storytelling. And that was kind of what started it. But then, you know, as I got a little older as a kid, I used to always say I wanted to be an entertainment attorney because I wanted to work with really famous people. And my goal was to meet like Sandra Bullock and Oprah random combination. I don't know why. And so, <laughs> uh, but I did mock trial in high school and I was like, oh, I don't think law is for me. And so then I thought about like, well, what is it I really have always loved? And it was, it was writing. And so it was about like ninth grade when I was like, I think I really want to do this. And so I went on to college and like majored in journalism and got my master's in arts journalism and, and that did it that way. But the written word Having it has been so helpful, especially now, because for me, it's not only vocation, it's like therapy. <laughs> of, of what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. I tell young people who, who've interviewed me or who've asked me for advice, I don't care what profession they want to go into. They have to know how to write. Mm -hmm. Writing is key. <laughs> and um sometimes they laugh at me, but our, our, I think our young people don't know how to write. And that scares me a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's not valued and taught as much in the education system as it used to be. I was telling a friend of mine, or actually, we were actually reminiscing the other day, I said, you know, I remember being in school, first grade teacher, we used to have phonics drills, where you used to go through your vowel and consonant sounds. And she would have this meter stick. Her name was Miss Battle. I don't know where on earth she is today. She had this meter stick and these charts on the walls. And as a class, we had to stand up and she would point at every sound and we had to say it in unison as a class. And if one person messed up, we had to start over. This was six years old, <laughs> you know what I mean, phonics. And that's not, that doesn't happen anymore, you know? But I think that the tools of communication and self-expression that we learned as a result of phonics and that mastery of language is just so helpful in so many areas of your life. Totally agree. I totally agree. Um, as you got older, when was the moment that you first realized, hey, I am a writer? Was it when you first saw your first byline what you know, when was that aha moment like okay i did it i am a writer ah uh, moment you know what it took me a little while i think the first time i really felt like i am a writer was uh when i was 27 so this was three years ago i got my first piece published in the new york times mm -hmm. i think it, it i think that was the I am a writer moment, honestly. Before then, I, f I think I was feeling like I might've been flailing a little bit. <laughs> How many copies of that paper did you buy? <laughs> I would have bought out the entire, as many as I could find. <laughs> I think I have five. <laughs> um, 
I was surprised by this. You didn't see your first Broadway show until you were 17. Although, did you grow up in Atlanta? Born and raised, yes. Born and raised. Because that area has such great theater all by itself. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go to New York with it. <laughs> but you, you, your first Broadway show was The Color Purple at mm-hmm. 17. So I want to know what that experience was like for you. And I say this, you know me well enough, you know where my heart is, so you know this is coming from a place of love. But going to see a show where there's so many black and brown talented bodies on stage. So not only seeing your first Broadway show, but seeing that show where there's so much people of color telling this iconic story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it, it meant, a, it, it was crazy because I remember, so the reason we were going to New York to begin with was because I was really interested in going to school at Columbia University and majoring in journalism. Because of course that's always, for years has been one of the best journalism programs in the country and it's very competitive. Spoiler alert, I did not get in. And, uh, (laughs) but that was the original reason why we were going to New York. What I did not know is that my mother had planned this whole other piece of the trip as a surprise to me because she took me like before Thanksgiving break and my birthday is around Thanksgiving, I'm a Scorpio. And so (laughs) um, she had planned this whole other piece of the trip where we went and we like went to Bubba Gump's in Times Square. I mean, did all the touristy things that like, I've been in New York enough times that I don't do now, but like went to Bubba Gump's and like spent, like we're out hanging out in Times Square at like two o'clock in the morning. And one of the things that she planned was that we went to see the color purple. And I don't know how much she spent on these tickets, Lauren, but Lauren, I kid you not, we were like orchestra level, maybe like sixth floor. And in that original production of The Color Purple, the stage was kind of a thrust. So it went out into the audience, like the apron jutted out and it was like these trees coming from it. It was a much more elaborate set in that first round on Broadway than it was the second in in the revival. And so we are, we are there. And I mean, that was just magical. And because I actually in high school, the year before had done a project on Alice Walker and kind of, um, I think it was like, we had to choose a book and kind of break down its structure. And I think as a part of my project, I had like written my own letters to God or something like that, because you know, the first uh, part of the color purple is like Seely's letters to God. And so it was just kind of a full circle moment. Alice Walker is from Georgia, you know? (laughs) Um, And so I remember just being enchanted by that whole experience. And as you're watching a show like that, are you dreaming about being an arts journalism and or arts journalist and writing theater criticism, or did you not know at that point what kind of journalist you wanted to be? Um, I was not thinking about arts journalism at all. So in high school and even in college, I did theater, but I was acting and directing actually. Um, so I was not thinking about arts journalism in that way. When I first thought about being a journalist, I wanted to be like the editor in chief of 17 because that was my world at that time. You know, when you're in high school, (laughs) I mean, I don't even think girls have that anymore. I think that that generation of like, like pouring over teen magazines is like long gone, but like, but there was, and especially during that time, it was like you had L Girl and Teen Vogue was newer back then and 17. And then we used to have this one, I think it was called YM. And then you had like Vibe and The Source. And I mean, it was just like pouring over magazines. Everybody was, you know, teen magazines were like the thing, teen people, you know, <laughs> so. So that's the kind of journalist you wanted to be. Yeah, that's what I envisioned. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that's so that's so funny because I think when I was growing up, my dream was to work for Oprah. Well, you mentioned Oprah. <laughs> that was like my dream. I was like, it's going to happen. I'm going to walk into WGN and she's going to discover me and I'm going to work for Oprah. That's the, that's the dream job. Um, so that's so funny. I mentioned that we know each other from the American Theater Critics Association, and you are the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, Mm -hmm. which casts a wide net. It's not just 
talking about um, writers of color, it's talking about writers with disabilities, it's, it's transgender, LGBTQ, it's, there's a lot under that umbrella. Um, it's very interesting to me, I follow a lot of our colleagues on social media and one of our outspoken colleagues <laughs> um, who is a writer of color and somebody I really admire, he had, um, I guess it was last fall, sometime last year, posted on social media that he, as a critic, a theater critic, he was going to pick up his tickets at the theater box office and he was treated fairly badly because of the color of his skin. Mm. And I was shocked that that would happen because I think, I, I feel like as a theater critic, we're often um, wined and dined and schmoozed when we walk into the theater because people want a good review. But have you ever, have you had any bad experiences going to the theater as a journalist? Um, or racist experiences or, ra or or experiences where you felt less than welcome in a theater because of the color of your skin? Oh, that's a big question. So I'll, I'll tell, I'll say a couple of things. Um, one is that unfortunately, the instance you describe happens more often than folks would think. Um, one of our biggest projects uh, for the Diversity and Inclusion Committee was that we created a database of diverse critics all across the country. What prompted the creation of that database actually was that our regional the uh, critic members of color and women in particular um, had challenges getting press tickets to the Broadway touring shows. Um, and I even, I remember when Hamilton came through Atlanta, all of the middle-aged white guy critics in town got press tickets to Hamilton and I didn't. And actually, I remember I tweeted about it and a bunch of actors in town, some of them, because the film industry is so big here, had, you know, conflicts, uh, had contracts with Netflix and stuff like that. So they had, you know, some names and they started retweeting and tagging Lin-Manuel Miranda in the tweets and all of this stuff. And um, next thing I know, I'm on the phone with the national press agent for Hamilton um, saying, you know, our intention is to be inclusive. We regret that this happened. And even at an ATCA conference, um, and I don't wanna give uh, too much away because I don't know how much of it was proprietary or not, but they had a producers panel with Broadway producers where this very topic came up. And I remember speaking to one of the big Disney Broadway producers and saying, hey, this is an issue. And they uh, took immediate action um, in some of their markets and changed some of their PR partners uh, for that very reason. So, I mean, we are slowly but surely making change in the industry, but unfortunately, um, granting legitimacy, if so to speak, to uh, women, to people of color, and to non-binary um, arts journalists and critics in particular has been an uphill battle because people think they're not used to seeing um, a person of color in particular in a position of authority on an art form that they view as inherently European. And so when you are the person sitting on the aisle seat uh, with a notebook in hand, that some people see that as a challenge to their norm. Um, another thing I'll, I'll mention, when you talk about um, not feeling welcome, I won't say that I've ever had an instance where I didn't feel welcome in the theater as much as I recognized that I was um, the exception and not the rule. I remember going to last fall, the press opening of Tina, the Tina Turner musical. And I have a great relationship with um, the press agency who handled that show. And they were very awesome, worked with me really well. Um, I brought my mom with me and her best friend who they completely relived their youth <laughs> in the chairs next to me at the Tina Turner musical. And 
what I recognized as I looked around me and my mother saw it too, she was like, wow. She was like, you know, we're like the only black people at this press opening on the orchestra level of this musical. Like she was like, you know, you look around and and we are like (laughs) the only people down here. And for a musical like that, you go, well, why is that? You know? Um, And so I think that there are those those types of moments I think happen more often than not where you start to recognize the urgency around correcting parity in the field and opening up the field to more diverse voices, not for any sort of tokenism or quota reasons, but to have more intelligent, insightful conversations about the art form. There is nothing lost by a diversity of perspectives. Oh, I'm sure you've seen this everywhere in Atlanta. We've seen it here regionally where all of these theaters now are coming up with their solidarity statements. Um, (laughs) Some land more sincere than others, (laughs) but I, how, how do we make our theaters more welcoming spaces? Because I've, I've been having this conversation over the last several weeks, it's not only the representation on stage, it's not only the representation backstage, but it is the re- representation of your audience as well. And that's a very interesting piece to me. So how do we create a more welcoming environment in our theater venues. And let me leave it, let let me leave it there and then I'll do follow up question to that. (laughs) Sure. Um, So, you know, the solidarity statements have been interesting because, uh, you know, we, as, as theater critics, as you know, we, we not only are familiar with theaters in our cities, but in others. And so as these solidarity statements have come out, I have been very aware of whose I believe and whose I don't. <laughs> um, because the theaters who I believe are the ones who were doing the work before this civic uprising uh, erupted. You know, I, I know the theaters in Atlanta and, some, and in some other cities where I feel welcome and at home and, and where I see diversity on their board and um, on their administrative staff and in their audience and in their educational programs. It's through and through and it's woven into the fabric of the organization. And then I know the theaters where you're going to get your play in February and that's it. Um, so <laughs> um, I think that action is the greatest form of solidarity. Um, So more than a statement, I'm interested in what is your 2021, 2022 season going to look like? What is your 2022, 2023 season going to look like? You know, I'm, I'm there. I, I'm, I'm not even interested in what you're doing in this 2020, 2021 season. I'm not interested in what you, the readings you're hosting right now. (laughs) as a scrambling rapid response <laughs> to a moment, I'm, I'm going to be looking at what you're doing five years from now. Um, so I, I'll say that much. As far as making theaters more welcoming spaces for all people, I think that, and I, I've said this before, I think that um, there are a couple things. One is that I think in general, we need more imagination. I've written about this on my blog recently. I think that as human beings, we cannot manifest what we can't imagine. And our artistic leaders at these various theater companies, producing organizations and institutions really need to take a long, hard look at who's in their imagination. What does your utopia look like when you envision it? If a diverse swath of people don't exist in your imagination, they will not feel welcome in your theater and they will not be on your stages. They won't design your shows. That's just what it is. You've got to first envision the world you want. So I, I will say imagination first. And the imagination, we could talk about the need for more imagination in the theater. We could ad nauseum, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, and, and, and the other thing I will say too, is that audience members, theater lovers, have to understand how much power they have. If you are a regular single ticket buyer, subscriber, patron to a theater in your community, 
you have more say than you think over what that theater's programming is. The board, the artistic staff, the managerial staff of that theater is choosing plays based on what they think your artistic talent can handle. And if you want greater variety, you only need to send an email <laughs> or make a phone call. If there is a show you have heard about from friends in other places and you want that theater to do it, as the audience, you have the power to demand it more than anything. And I think that audiences need to really, really know and own that. Like they have, they can dictate so much because without ticket sales, the theater doesn't exist. Yes, it's true. And I, I think that, you know, I think patrons need to speak up because I had a long talk with somebody today about funding and she said, yes, funding is an issue at the grant level and, and the administrative level, but patron funding and support speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, those, those dollars, you, you can drive the programming with an email or a phone call. <laughs> yes. I, I talk, okay, so if you are watching this and you are a regular um, viewer to these video interviews and live chats, you know that in practically every single live chat, I ask about coded language. And I know some of you scratch your head about the coded language question, and it's Calandra who um, first had me thinking about coded language. So you can blame her because <laughs> I ask this question almost every interview. And Calandra um, and David Chavez last um, year at the National Black Theater Festival, we had a mini conference and the diversity and inclusion committee of our association did a, a, a kind of a mini workshop. And in that mini workshop, we examined and explored articles written by other people <laughs> that, that had problematic encoded language in it. And that has become a little bit of an obsession for me. I'm now constantly trying to tease out coded language in my own work, um, as I edit pieces from our editorial staff, when I see it, some it's more obvious than others. But right now we are all glued to the news, especially the last couple of weeks um, with all of the um, news surrounding George Floyd's murder and up to the, <laughs> up to the killing in Atlanta last night. Um, as we watch mainstream media and we are curators of media, what kind of coded language are you hearing in the coverage? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> because most of the people covering these stories are white journalists sitting there in Minneapolis, in their little cute jeans and their little masks, and they're white covering the. I mean, that's sadly the state of our media. So, yes. So, <laughs> when it comes to coded language, I first want to say that the reason why we chose to do the workshop on coded language, and I really have to give my co chair, David Chavez, credit for this one, is because we recognize that. When it comes to words, we all know there's denotation and there's connotation. Denotation is what the word actually means. Connotation is what we associate with it. And when we start to give into coded language in theater criticism, journalism, and in our world, it's lazy writing and it's a bad shorthand. So some of the things we talked about in that workshop, for example, as you recall, is like when we call uh, people who are living with disabilities brave, you know, we always say it's such a brave performance, um, which is minimizing the talent of the person on stage, right? Or when we call women whimsical or precocious, um, what are we really saying? 
or, or spunky, you know, or uh, when you have Latinas on stage and you say spicy or sexy, what is it you're really saying there? Are you actually describing the experience you had with the piece of art that you're engaging with? Or are you describing your impression of the actor based on stereotypes that has nothing to do with the artwork you've just experienced, right? So then if we want to take that out, right? Because <laughs> the theater is a microcosm for our world. So if we want to take that on a macro level and look at what's happening in society right now, I am seeing television news media in general, um, local and cable news stations, every single last one of them, trip over themselves left and right trying to talk around coded language and giving into it i mean i think that you know we hear about we hear it when folks are talking about the protest they're like you know when we insert the word peaceful peaceful protest and i the term peaceful protest to me is so it's an oxymoron if there was peace we would need to protest what is a peaceful protest like i'm so confused <laughs> Um, so, you know, I mean, even a hunger strike is not a peaceful protest. I mean, because if all those people drop dead from hunger, like, where's the peace? You know, what I mean, like, I, it's it's not. So I, I think, you know, just the, the readiness to kind of insert the word peaceful, like we stand behind peaceful protests. There's coded language in there because there's then an undercurrent of saying that these people are violent. And I think that we also have to recognize um, that when we, what happens in our minds and in our hearts based on what we've been told, when we see a group of black and brown and native American folks out in the street in mass appearing to be what we say is angry, right? That's another word that we see um, used a lot. Are they angry or are they afraid? Are they angry or are they tired? You know, so we have to dig deeper than just the shorthand that we've been given. So that's some of the coded language we've seen around, um, I think the protests, especially in the last few weeks that I've seen a lot of news stations um, stumbling over, um, especially when it comes to that as describing things as violent, angry, um, unruly. And it's like, is it that? I mean, let's call chaos chaos. This is chaotic, right? <laughs> let's call it what it is. But then let's dig deeper and ask, what's really happening here? It's the same thing. I'll go back to what we were dealing with, you know, six months ago. Geez, 2020 has been five million years long. Um, when we were dealing with kids in cages, right, at the border. And we had all of this language calling you know, people illegal, right? A person can't be illegal. A person can do something illegal, but you inherently are not like, what is that? You know, um, we also have to, um, when we, we heard coverage about um, what was happening at the border as well, we heard a lot of framing of that as um, people, child separation and people being put in detention centers, particularly the children as like a consequence for an action. And I think one of the things that we're reckoning with as a country uh, on a macro level and that the theater is reckoning with as an art form is what is a life worth? You know, are we a place of second chances that we say we are in this country? Are we a place for redemption? Are we a place of love and forgiveness? What is a life work? You know, we, what we saw happen in Minneapolis with George Floyd was that, you know, somebody decided that allegedly spending a counterfeit $20 bill was worth your life, you know? And then security footage later found that it wasn't him. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it wasn't even him spending the $20 bill. But we have to ask ourselves, what is a life worth? Same thing with the situation that we're dealing with now in Atlanta. You know, unfortunately, this man was behind the wheel of a car intoxicated he fell asleep in the Wendy's drive through should he have been intoxicated behind the wheel of a car no but now that we've seen the video where the police officer woke him up and he said oh I can call a ride to take me home you know is a life worth one moment how many of us when we were in high school and college could that have been I mean let's tell the truth <laughs> you know so um, I think that we have to ask ourselves, what's a life worth to us? And I think that right now we have 
a whole lot of different answers from uh, different people. Sadly. Sadly. Um, and my question when I think about it, you know, I have a son who just reached drinking age. If my white son was in the drive through at Wendy's and fell asleep intoxicated, what what would his punishment have been? And I don't know that they would have killed him. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have. Yeah, I mean, I think he probably would have had a DUI and a very difficult phone call with you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, and, and, but it, it may be after that difficult phone call, he would have wished he was dead because I would have killed him. <laughs> but, um, but that was my initial thought when I was watching the news last night is if this, if his skin was a different color, would we be watching this on the news right now? I don't think so. And that- I don't think so either. And that's what, where this question, what is the life worth? What is, and, and it doesn't matter the age of the person and it doesn't matter, you know, somebody was telling me with, in blackness, there's, <laughs> And I don't remember where I heard this. I think maybe the Dave Chappelle video that just came out. Um, we're just talking about location, location, location. What, you know, it's where you are. It's what you look like. It's what you're doing at the time that defines, are you angry? Are you safe? Are you, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting. But then we see that completely corrupted by like the Amy Cooper situation. Because I mean, this man was bird watching. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I recently said to a friend of mine, I said, if the college educated middle aged bird watcher isn't safe, it is open season on everybody. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because bird watchers are a very eclectic, eccentric group of people inherently anyway. And they tend to very much exist you know, in solitude as he was doing in that bird sanctuary. And so if you can't be by yourself with some binoculars and watch some birds, I don't know what's going on. Um, it's just, it's wild. And I think, you know, it all comes down to that question of what is a life worth? What is your life worth? And, and one of the things that I think that we have to restore in this country is uh, that everybody is inherently valuable, um, no matter who you are. Um, because I think that so many people aren't valuing uh, black lives and brown lives because they don't value their own lives. Um, and so I think that we have got to get back to that 100%. So as we dissect, because I dissect every word that I write, that my, like I said, that my um, editorial staff writes. And then when I watch the news, I'm teasing out language because I attended this really good workshop last year at the Black Theater Festival. Um, so how can we be better curators of the media that we consume? Um, that's a good question. So I would say a few things that folks should know. One is that the media you consume, particularly um, in a journalistic context, is not the end of a conversation. Um, journalists, pundits, personalities that you see on TV, they are not the end all be all. Anything they say that piques your interest or that you take in as fact, research it for yourself first. And I think that's sometimes something people forget is that you are being given access to information for you to then explore more. I never want to form an opinion about an issue or an incident based on one article I've read or one news report I've seen or one conversation I've heard. I've got to be able to read and look at multiple sources, multiple things before I can afford, form an informed opinion. Okay, so I think that's one thing folks has, have got to remember, especially in the democratization of media where there are so many different outlets, so many different platforms, you've got to be able to do your research. The other thing that I think folks need to understand the distinction between is that there's a difference between journalism and a talk show and like punditry, right? Like it's, those are all different things. I don't know that most people realize, especially on like CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, some of those cable news stations, 
most of the people who are the anchors of those shows, they're actually talk show hosts, right? Their background is not in journalism. So they're not trained in reporting. They're not tra trained in objectivity or fairness or balanced reporting. They didn't have that education. A lot of them come from the background of either being media personalities or being lobbyists or attorneys. Um, there are a lot of attorneys sitting behind news desks these days. And um, attorneys, go forth with they argue a point right everything is a matter of guilt or innocence and it's about proving the other side wrong right that's their training so a journalistic training is about gathering information from xyz number of sources putting it together presenting it to a public and then letting that public decide two very different approaches to the job Right. So I think that's the other thing folks need to know is that there's definitely a distinction between talk shows and punditry and lobbying and opinion versus actual journalism. Now, unfortunately, what we have seen <laughs> over the last, I would say, decade and a half is that there are some outlets that people typically went to for journalism that started to lean uh, more to you know, a political leaning one way or another. And so the information that they chose to report was being driven by a corporation's political inclinations as opposed to the information that the public needed. And that's a place where journalism has to, uh, you know, get better 100%. Absolutely do better. And, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm also very disturbed by this notion of fake news. I have been for a while as a journalist myself because mm -hmm. I try to report the truth. I took those ethics classes in school very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, do you think some of this attitude or laziness as we take in our news is being trickled down from this permissive president who's given us um, some of us licensed to be lazy and just say, oh, okay, I, I'm going to pick the station that has my political view and that's where I'm going to get my information. <laughs> is, is it coming from this administration and his attack on the media? Um, I don't, I don't think the buck stops with him. I think this started before him. I, I don't think he's helped <laughs> the situation, <laughs> but I, I won't, I won't put all of that on, on the current president. I don't think that this started with him and I don't think it would end with him either. Um, the thing that I find disheartening, um, with the distrust in media and the, um, use of terms like fake news and alternative facts, I'll talk about coded language, is that um, people are talked out of the truth of their experiences. I think that one of the things that um, troubles me so much is when I look at, especially like cities in um, the Midwest and, and in, um, in the North and in New England um, that had heavy manufacturing for, uh, for example, presence. Um, and you see how the economies of those cities were totally swept away um, when corporations chose to outsource their operations to foreign countries and exploit labor in foreign countries because it was cheaper. Right, but that's not the narrative <laughs> that is given to the American people. The American people are given the narrative that, you know, the immigrants took the jobs or that the people in other countries took the jobs. And it's like, well, there was a person here who made a choice, right? Like a, an active decision was made. And so then you see this tendency for the loyalty to be with the corporation instead of the truth of the experience of the people. You know, I don't want to wax poetic and get, you know, deep into the politics of this thing here. But I mean, I even think about places like Flint, Michigan, where I'm like, if a corporation's going to exit a city and leave it devastated in the way it did Flint, Mich Michigan, there should have been a demand for an exit strategy that the corporation that left was responsible for rebuilding the infrastructure of the city that they damaged through their operations when they were there, right? I mean, I, I think these are the things that we can demand from companies that aren't paying taxes. Yes. 
you know, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. And so I think that's what I find most disheartening. And like I said, I don't blame the president for this. I think this started before him, but I hate seeing people being talked out of the reality of their experience because it makes you feel crazy. And then, and then you know, we have what we have now. You know, it's so interesting when you talk about the narrative we're being presented um, when we're watching television, um, the first night of the protests here in Raleigh, um, the protests the entire day were, I'm not going to say peaceful, but I will say they were nonviolent. They were um, somewhat organized. They didn't seem completely organized right that those first couple of days. They're a little bit more organized now. Um, but they were definitely nonviolent from everything I was hearing from my friends who were down there. And in the evening, all of a sudden, businesses were getting looted and there was a lot of violence. And what, if you're just watching the news and you're not a curious person who's questioning the news that you're consuming, it may appear that the black and brown people protesting are the ones that are causing the violence and the looting and the damage. And a friend of mine who was there um, posted some video that a lot of the violence and the looting that we were seeing, some of it was instigated by the police who were throwing tear gas some of it was instigated by white folks who had gone there to make it look like the black and brown folks nonviolently protesting were causing this trouble. And I thought, I showed the video to my husband that my friend had taken on their cell phone. And I said, why isn't this the video that we're seeing? This is not the narrative we're seeing of these white folks causing problems. We're just seeing the narrative that people think we want to see. And that's where I have an issue with the news is that we, we've gone away from telling the whole story and being objective. We're just telling the little piece and sound bites and what sells news. <laughs> yeah, I will never forget uh, being a freshman, maybe a sophomore, sophomore in intro to journalism class and professor saying, um, something I'll never forget and I keep with me always. When the camera is pointed towards something, it's pointed away from something else. And that is always the case. Assume that whatever shot you're seeing is not the only shot. Assume that there is a wider, bigger story happening at all times. But I wanna pull back from something you said a little bit which is um, when we talk, going back to that point of, you know, what is a life worth, right? So I'm more just le less than, you know, the burning and the looting and the rioting and all that stuff. I'm more concerned about how we have become so well-trained to know that the way to grab attention is by doing economic damage as opposed to damage to a life right? So I'm, I'm so, I, I'm more disturbed by that, is that the way to get people to issue a solidarity statement <laughs> is to bust the windows out of a target, or to say we're no longer going to get our coffee from Starbucks, or to, <laughs> in Atlantic City, I, there was all this footage of like these young white kids, you know, I know exactly where the outlets are in Atlantic City. I, I remember going on a road trip to Atlantic City when I used to live in uh, New York. And there are these premium outlets and there was this footage in the first set of protests where you see all of these young white people like running down the street with like Coach and Lululemon bags, which is just like <laughs> so middle class. <laughs> But <laughs> it's like such a middle class moment. Um, but I say all that to say that, you know, 
what are what's happening in a world and in a country where the way to get attention about the loss of life is by trying to institute your own economic impact or your own economic consequence like i'm more troubled by that um than anything else and then you know people's perception of what's happening is completely economic you know because then they go oh they're all people are only protesting because they want to riot and loot so that they can take things that they don't want to have to work for right and that is completely a twisted talk about coded language that's another twisted narrative that we see in the uh, news media quite a bit is that folks are only doing this because they don't want to work i think if one thing has become extremely clear to me throughout this period of covid 19 is that white black brown asian whatever your race or ethnicity people are really really wanting to work <laughs> People can't wait to get back to work. Meanwhile, I'm working from home like, oh, I could get used to this. But everybody else is like, can't wait to get back to work. So I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to turn to arts journalism for a second. Um, <laughs> I chuckle. This is how Galandra and I met. We were walking into a workshop and she looked at me and she goes, girl, we have to go for a cup of coffee because we are the only ones under a certain age <laughs> in this organization, which has kind of changed now because there are more and more young people joining the organization. But at the mm -hmm. time, Calendra and I were it. <laughs> and um, I, I wonder, I, I feel like we're in a moment for arts journalism. Prior to COVID, um, our arts coverage in major newspapers was a dying art form. Um, most of our newspapers are dying a slow and painful death and arts coverage is just not important um, to their advertisers. <laughs> and so people are getting less and less inches. And then more and more people like me, like you who have blogs, we are turning to these digital formats to write. How do we open our association, open our industry, open our journalism to more people of color, to more LGBTQ writers, how do we make this a more welcoming, um, viable career field for not the typical white middle-aged theater critic that everyone's been used to seeing for years and years? Mm -hmm. um, that's a multi-layered uh, thing. So what I will say is that one of the uh, things, and I will agree with you that I have seen at could do is transform in terms of membership makeup over the last uh, few years. Um, there has really been a push to get a wider uh, variety of people in the organization, whether we're talking about race, gender, sexual orientation, age, I mean, everything. I have seen the change, even in our executive committee leadership, when we get the results of our election, uh, I think we will be to the point where we probably have one of the most diverse executive committees in the theater industry period um, across region and everything else. So I think that, and it's, it has made us a richer organization. I think the work of our critics has gotten better. I think the trust that our critics have been able to form in their communities. I mean, I'm looking at what you're doing right now and the reputation that our critics have been able to build in their communities has benefited. Um, diversity has been a huge benefit. Uh, to the organization and to the individual critics. Um, and we are continuing our education initiatives. Um, I know one of the things that uh, I have, I'll say this now, one of the things that the Diversity and Inclusion Committee has been discussing is we're going to be doing a eight part training series, virtual sessions that anybody can attend. Um, on various topics in theater. It'll range from um, youth theater to puppetry theater to you know diversity in theater. I mean, we've got to interviewing styles. So it's it's going to be a very cool and there'll be more information coming about that soon. Um, so I say that we, we are pushing and we're doing the work, um, but we also have a long way to go. Um, and one of the things that I think that we have to do as an organization to make it 
more welcoming to a wider swath of people is look outside of who we know right? Expand your network, expand your horizons, stretch yourself. The internet is awesome because you can meet people in any corner of the globe without ever having to leave your house. And I think it's time for folks to get curious about what's happening um, on the side of the tracks they don't live on, so to speak. Um, And I think that when we do that and we start to recognize that everybody has something awesome to contribute we'll all be better off. I think it's a heart and mind thing that has to happen first. Um, And I think that's the hardest part of everything that's happening in our world right now is that we, this is not about one decision. This is about 7 billion little decisions, right? (laughs) And so we, we've got to get critical mass around love, you know, and that's the thing that uh, we have to be pushing for every day. Um, Now, if we're talking also though about viability of the profession. I think the role of the arts journalist has changed a lot since we've been in this pandemic. Typically, a lot of folks viewed the arts journalist simply as the critic, right? But now people are turning to arts journalism to know what to stream and what their favorite dance companies, art galleries, theaters are putting on virtually, whether we're talking about staged readings or availability of past performances online or virtual gallery tours or whatever. People are looking to arts journalists and to artists uh, for reprieve and for relief and to help them navigate their emotions and experiences. I also think that artists are now looking to arts journalists as places to tell their stories. We are seeing a reckoning happening in the American theater where folks are exposing organizations, whether we talk about Second City in Chicago, or whether we're talking about what's happening with Florida State University, um, or whether we're talking about, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. People are sending out their stories to reporters saying, you know, this is what's been happening here. You know, we've got 10, 20 people to back this up. I mean, we saw what happened with uh, Griffin Matthews when he posted the Instagram post about what happened behind the scenes at Witness Uganda in New York. I mean, it's everywhere. So people are now looking for arts journalists for that as well, for information about what's happening in these organizations. So I think though as arts journalists, we've had to pivot during COVID, meaning we're not reviewing as much. There are some of us, especially in regions who are doing quite a bit of cultural writing and reporting um, you know, I'm working on three stories right now. <laughs> I'm just like, how did this happen? <laughs> um, because people are looking for like, well, what's happening with this and what's happening with that? Because people don't know what cultural institutions that they love will exist on the other side of this, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, and that's a big thing that they're depending on arts journalists to track. And so I think again, back to the audience, if you're somebody who loves the arts, If you're somebody who wants a wider variety of reporting at your daily paper, your local news station, your city magazine, whatever the case may be, you as the subscriber, you as the reader, you wield the power. You demand the coverage that you want. What a lot of folks don't know is that most publications do what they call reader surveys, right? And they hire these consulting firms and spend an ungodly amount of money for these consultants to basically tell them, oh, people aren't interested in anything except politics and business. So then when you wonder why all you're seeing on TV and in reading in the paper is politics and business coverage, it's because they sent a very small sample (laughs) of the readership of a publication, a what are you most interested in sort of survey question And that's how you get the elimination of arts and culture uh, coverage and and, and lifestyle coverage. If you want more of that, you have the power to email the editor, the publisher, the managing editor, reporters from those publications. And if you flood their inboxes and their mailboxes saying, we want more, that's how you get arts journalism back to being a viable profession in the traditional sense. Now, in the other sense, there's also the nonprofit model, which a lot of folks are going to as well, where you're having grant funded and sponsored uh, publications um, where people, it's basically like crowdsourced journalism is what I call it, are funding the type of things they want to see. And that, you know, can be a viable route as well. But again, I think most of the power lies in the audience. 
an interesting um okay so we are nearing the hour but i have a big loaded question to ask you so do you have a few more minutes to spend with me sure sure yeah okay because i want to honor your time but i really want to i really want to ask you this question but it's a it's a biggie I was um, long-winded there. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, this is why I love you. This is why I wanted to have you on with me because I love um, listening to you. And I love, oh, and by the way, shameless plug, she gives workshops. So if you are looking for someone to come in and do a workshop for your organization, Calandra, it might just be your person. And she lives in Atlanta, which is not too far away. So um, one conversation that's been had in our arts community here. Um, one of our well-known Black artists had posted on her social media to other Black artists, what do you need to divest from your white arts organizations? What do we need to divest from white institutions? And it got me thinking a little bit about a conversation that was started at the National Black Theater Festival last summer within our organization. Can a white journalist, can a white theater critic, can a white arts journalist cover or write about a black theater production or black um, and I'm not talking about a color purple. If I go see the color purple on the national tour, that is a lot different than our local black artists doing a devised piece of work mm -hmm. or doing an original production. So I know there have been, I know in Canada last February, there was an artist who, an indigenous artist who um, basically put out a call and said, the only people who, can review my show are going to be people of color, critics of color. And my initial response was, there aren't that many critics of color out there to review your show. So is that the answer? Can white arts journalists, white theater critics cover shows written, devised, performed by people of color? Um, so I will say there are, there are probably more critics of color out there than folks think. There are not a lot, but there are probably more than folks think. And it's they just generally aren't given the opportunities and the platform um, because you know everything's a pipeline. Everything's about who you know. And so if you didn't go to the school that, that paper normally recruits from, then you know, you're automatically not on the shortlist. So I, I do want to say that um, there's definitely a need for more, but there, there are probably more than folks think. Um, as far as can a white critic review a work by um, a black artist, especially when we're talking about devised pieces or very culturally specific pieces that don't necessarily have the ubiquity right of something like a color purple. Um, I think the answer is yes, um, with the caveat that there's a great need for um, some cultural education. I think that like with anything, um, when you go in to do a review, and you are in the position of cultural authority, right, in that moment, taste maker, taste elevator, um, connector. I mean, those are all roles we talk about that, you know, the theater critic plays and the arts journalist plays. Then you've got to have an understanding of the culture that you're about to engage with. And um, that goes across the board. So, and you've got to do your work. I will, I'll give an example. So I remember I went to go see a show um, in New York a couple years ago um, and it was called Homecoming and it was at Atlantic Theater Company. Mm -hmm. And um, Homecoming is written by, I want to say she's Nigerian American playwright and um, is very much rooted in Nigerian American themes. And in one of the scene, scenes of the show, there is uh, some sort of, there is a, well, not in, at one point, throughout the show, there is a ceremony taking place around the audience. And it is very much rooted in a West African tradition. And I remember sitting in that audience and I knew that a ceremony was taking place around me. And I, I knew that it was representing something, but I wasn't quite sure <laughs> what was happening. 
Um, and that's the moment where you've got to write down as much as possible about what you can gather and then start to do some research as a critic before you make a judgment about that piece of art. Because it was a beautiful play. It was well done. Um, even with the parts of it I did not understand, I took something away from the show. It, it was really a beautiful production. But if you don't have that cultural understanding, how are you going to give that thing a fair review? And so you've got to be curious and there's so much source material to be able to um, learn. Because often when we see shows, there's a, a director's note. You can sometimes ask for the script and get a playwright's note from that. Um, so many folks are on social media and have personal websites. You can look at the artist's websites and do some research on who they are. I mean, there's a lot, there are press releases, there's dramaturgical information, usually available for shows. There's so much source material for you to be able to do your research. So then when people flub in reviews, it's like, well, you didn't really have an excuse because there was so much information available to you. And then that causes distrust between artists of color and the critics because the artists of color are just like, well, you just don't get me. And what it translates to is not only do you not get me, you're not interested. You, you're, you want to lean on your own conclusions about what you think my life and my experience is. You didn't even bother to investigate. Uh, that's how it comes off. And so I don't, I, I'm not a believer that you have to be the same race or ethnicity or religion or culture as an artist to review the work or to give the work a fair review, but I do think you have to have some cultural understanding. You know, I reviewed On Your Feet a few months ago, and because I have spent time in the Latinx community, and because I have friends who are Cuban, and because I've listened to Gloria Estefan's music, and I because I have been to Estefan Kitchen in Miami, you know, because I have had these experiences, when I review On Your Feet, though I am not Latinx, I can give it a fair review because I have a cultural familiarity. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, and I think you have to, when you see a show, when I see a show, I'm not only paying attention to what's going on on stage, I'm also paying attention to what's going on around me. And two examples I can think of is seeing American Sun in New York and seeing Memphis in Fayetteville. Um, in both those situations, there was a lot of diversity. There were a lot of black and brown bodies in the audience, which was so wonderful to see. But particularly in Memphis, there were certain parts of the show as I was watching it, <laughs> there was a black family behind me and they would react to certain moments of the show that had they not been sitting behind me, I probably would have overlooked. But in my notes, I wrote down, this might be a significant moment, even though I'm not sure why it's significant, I need to research that further. And for me, it was a much richer theatrical experience because I was coming at it from a place of curiosity, not just, oh, yeah, good music, good costumes. I like the dancing. It was what is hitting these, these audience members around me mm -hmm. that I'm not understanding or I'm not getting. Why is this important? Why is this significant? And I think that's part of our job is to not just pay attention to what's happening in front of us, but pay attention to what's happening around us. Absolutely, 100%, 100%. You've got to pay attention to what's happening in the audience, absolutely. And, and who's responding to what and why. And if you're not, you know, there's a lot of shows. I, I think it's beyond, oh, I really like this show. I really didn't like this show. Um, a colleague of mine and I saw a show that we really did not like at all. Um, <laughs> and um, it was based on this movie in the 90s. It had nothing to do with race. It was like this old 90s movie that really should not have been made into a musical, but was. And we are of a certain age, so we just found it offensive and horrible. And yet the people next to us who were um, fans of this movie, they loved it. And so I said to my colleague, 
we're missing something. We have to view the show from that perspective to be able to give a fair review. Not that we have to say we love it, but we have to say, maybe people of a certain age might like it. Or maybe people of a certain demographic might like it. Or maybe people who love this movie, who understand it in a way we don't, because we're old. <laughs> we're looking at it from the mama perspective and they are looking at it from, I was a teen in the 90s, I remember this. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's important to pay attention. Yeah, definitely, for sure. I've, I've definitely sat in audiences where the show was hitting the audience more than it was hitting me um, or differently than it was hitting me 100%. And I think you can write that in your review because I think that opens up a conversation. Um, and I think that um, more writers need to be less afraid to reveal when they feel conflicted about something or when they're having a different response to a piece than the audience is. I think that's something fair to include, I've certainly done it where I've said, you know, I thought this was hilarious. The audience was crickets. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I mean, that's happened to me and the opposites happened, so. Um, so in your bio, it says your dream, you know, not that you're a little bit of an overachiever, but your dream is to write a New York Times bestselling novel and open a late night dessert restaurant. <laughs> so. <laughs> What is your favorite pandemic dessert or snack? <laughs> oh gosh, Lauren, I've eaten it all. I've eaten it all. Like I, I put on my pants sometime to make sure they fit. I, um, <laughs> I think chocolate martinis are my favorite pandemic dessert and they are nothing but sugar and heavy whipping cream. <laughs> Okay, everyone, who wants Calandra's recipe for <laughs> chocolate martini? I just, <laughs> oh, my word. Yes. Chocolate is my downfall. Chocolate on Oreos. <laughs> or, oh, my God. Or I, I bought a pack of double stuffed Oreos and I looked at them today and I was like, this is, this is all of your vices laid right before you. <laughs> Evidence. <laughs> <laughs> with you. Um, what is on your pandemic playlist? Oh, so I've been listening to a lot of different things. I've been because a, a lot of um, artists have been doing um, these Instagram live concerts and Facebook live concerts. And so my playlist has really been these concerts like Nora Jones does like four o'clock, like almost every, I want to say like every Thursday, um, she does a, a 4 p.m. concert and she's just like a soothing balm. But then like there's a, a duo I love, Chloe and Hallie, who they just put out a, um, a new album. And so I was listening to that. Um, but then, I mean, it just, it's literally, I look at like some of my favorite artists and I'm like, well, who's live today? And I kind of go through and try to get that live music experience. I mean, the fortunate thing, I guess, about this pandemic, if we're looking at the plus side, is there's so many live streams right now that you can see your favorite artists performing with, at almost daily. <laughs> there's mm -hmm. something in their know. living rooms. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I so appreciate this. I appreciate you. I cannot wait to see you in person and take another one of your workshops. Um, let me know about this um, multi-week workshop coming up and I will get the word out um, to folks on our website and platform and just stay safe and healthy so we can get back to what we do. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for having me and I wish you and your family all the best. Get a cute mask, everybody, and just rock it out. I've got one with sequins on it. You've got to, you've got to accessorize <laughs> for what makes you excited. <laughs> yes, I, I bought a Playbill mask because I was like, I just have to do something with the theater because it just has to happen. But um, anyway, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Um, I put out the schedule earlier. Um, 
well, late last night, earlier today um, for this week. So you can check out our schedule of live chats and live streams um, going on this week. We are, it's an incredible lineup. Um, tomorrow, I'm such a fan. He knows this because I told him Tristan Andre Parks is joining me and we are going to talk about dance um, not only as not only for dance sake but for social justice social activism sake and I just cannot wait to have that conversation so come back tomorrow night as I have my conversation with Tristan and um, thank you so much Calandra so thank nice you. connecting with you <laughs> Yes, big hugs. <laughs> yes, cool. And I will put the link to your blog and your articles as well so people can follow you and see what you're up to. Awesome. Well, Thank I'm you. A writer. So you have to see her articles. <laughs> I'll put links. Thank you. Have a great night and stay safe and healthy. And I hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Good night.